Good morning, everybody. It's Dave Neal, stand-up comic host of Bachelor Nation News. Update in the Clayton Eckerd paternity case scandal uh, that is going on right now. Uh, Jane Doe's lawyer, the uh, lady accusing Clayton of being the father of her unborn and never-born twins, uh, has filed a motion to compel lunch so that Clayton's attorney and him can iron some things out before getting into the courtroom, uh, which we'll discuss, but uh, that's breadsticks for you, baby. That's how it all works. You get lunch, you have a conversation, a power lunch, they call it, the whole deal. My only concern with a motion to compel lunch would be, would what they say be on the record? You know, you'd want to make sure everything is, you know, you know, you want, you, you're very defensive right here. Of course, uh, it's, um, you know, he has th- discussed that in past cases, people he's gone up against have lost their bar license, which is a threat that he is making in one way or another that he's going to come after the bar license of Woodnick Law. Again, I'm not saying this as sort of like, I wonder what he's thinking. That's kind of just what it is. It's like, um, you know, he says, I've gone after people and they are now homeless. Or I go after people and they now, you know, live in a, um, you know, in a uh, homeless shelter. These are these are things that he has said. That might be true. They might he he might have fought cases against lawyers that now live in homeless shelters. But um, I think the threat would be considered as veiled. Um, I don't know. You guys tell me. Uh, but either way, here's the motion to compel lunch for alternative relief. I do like the idea behind this. Like, figure it out before you bring it into the courtroom. Solve issues that you can. But at the same time, um, it would be generous of Wooden Nick Law to want to play ball with him, given kind of how, I believe, hard and aggressive he kind of came into this case. Various procedural rules require lawyers to talk in person or by phone before they may file motions. Email discussions are not enough. But what if a lawyer refuses to talk with you? How can counsel complete the mandatory pre-filing conference requirements of Rule 9C when opposing counsel won't accept your calls? Um, I don't know how much uh, Woodnick Law has to converse with them regarding uh, posting their discovery, but it looks like they're going to refuse to share discovery Um Maybe because it's not good. I don't know. I don't know. You know, you would think that if if Jane Doe had discovery that proved her point, she would be so willing to share it. So anyway, he goes into the fact that 20 years ago, a classic decision from the irreplaceable Honorable Pendleton Gaines, deceased in Physicians' Choice of Arizona, Inc. versus Miller, um, created this um, this like motion to compel lunch. Undaunted plaintiffs' counsel filed a motion to compel acceptance of lunch invitation, asking the court to order recalcitrant defense counsel to meet for lunch. In his order granting the motion, the judge explained, the court has searched in vain in the Arizona rules of civil procedure in cases as well as the leading treaties on federal and Arizona procedure to find specific support for plaintiff's motion. Finding none, the court concludes that motions of this type are so clearly within the inherent powers of the court and have been so routinely granted that they are non-controversial and require no precedential support. Um, All right, so I guess it's cool to get lunch with somebody. That's fine. Um... I mean, I say bring the judge along. Why don't you guys, why don't you do lunch in the courtroom with the judge? Why don't we, why don't we just do that? Uh, as promised, I would fly out to Arizona and mediate a lunch if need be, or at least sit in the booth next door with a little like, hey, what did you say? Just kind of writing it down as I get, um, you know, cheeseburgers. Uh, by the sa- And by the way, why does it have to be lunch? I don't understand. I, I get the whole breaking of the bread thing. I understand metaphorically lunch is like a communal activity where you can get together, but um, maybe just take a meeting together. But I understand it's called it's called um, compelling for lunch. Um, as someone in my comment section yesterday posted, their dog uh, files motions to compel for lunch every day. My dog as well. Just compelling me to feed him. By the same authority, understand counsel for petitioner Jane Doe moves the court for an order requiring Respondents Counsel Greg Woodnick to accept an invitation to meet for lunch. Without needlessly delving into the details, there has been a communication breakdown. No, please, dive into the details. Wouldn't the judge want to know the details? Uh, You have one side saying there's been a breakdown in communication. How? Why? Share with us, resulting in Mr. Woodnick refusing to speak with undersigned counsel by phone. Mr. Woodnick may offer some explanation for why this has occurred, but that is mostly beside the point. No, it's the whole point. Share it. It's not beside the point. Share, share, share. Share it with the court. If Mr. Woodnick chooses to describe his reasons, it would ultimately be counterproductive since it would only lead undersigned counsel to offer a detailed rebuttal. Rebut! Share your reasons. Rebut. Give the judge something to work with. This would only expand the conflict, not narrow it. So instead of detailing the reasons leading to the communication breakdown, the undersigned offers some simple avowals to the court. 
Understand Counsel has now obtained a complete copy of Miss Jane Doe's file from her former attorney, Corey Keith. They don't have one from Lexi Linval, but she was there so brief they don't need it. Upon reviewing Mr. Keith's file and looking at recent disclosures provided by Mr. Eckerd's side, it's clear this case is extremely complicated and there are many factual and legal issues Counsel needs to discuss urgently. Uh, to, uh, discuss by the end of the day or are we keeping the case? Uh, to offer some specific examples, please, we like examples. Uh, just days ago on March 29th, Mr. Eckerd provided a second supplemental disclosure statement in this document mr ecker disclosed for the first time that he intends to call nine witnesses at trial including three experts who were not previously disclosed despite this mr ecker has disclosed no expert reports of any kind nor has he disclosed the substance of each expert's testimony the opinions to be offered by the experts and the basis upon which the experts opinions were formed so i'm not sure some people said well it's within the 60-day window they don't have to offer these expert these disclosures until what today or tomorrow i'm not entirely sure about that mr ecker's extremely late and thus far incomplete expert disclosures raises the possibility and likelihood that miss jane doe will need to retain her own experts, and or possibly bring a motion to exclude Mr. Eckerd's experts. However, due to Mr. Eckerd's failure to disclose sufficient information about what, if anything, his experts plan to say, it is impossible to know if a motion would be appropriate. I guess it's hard for Clayton's experts to know what they need to say because they haven't received Jane Doe's discovery. So my guess is the experts that Clayton has are just general, this is again my guess, are general experts ready to speak about HCG, medical tests, little to no DNA. Um, they're ready to speak about uh, miscarriages and, you know, to speak about why they believe all of what Jane Doe says happened didn't happen. That's my guess. But without her giving any of these hardline information with her, you know, you know, she hasn't given the the photos she has of her stillbirths and this and that or miscarriages or whatever the hell she wants to call them. So without any of that, how are we supposed to know what the experts are there to cover? Now, what's interesting, too, is this whole little to no fetal DNA thing is probably the, probably the most science that exists at this point, the most medicine, we, the most medical record we have, because she has provided little to no medical records other than HCG tests that are way off the marks they should be for someone pregnant with twins, let alone pregnant with a single baby. And at the same time, little to no fetal DNA, as far as I'm concerned, um, shows that she's never been pregnant. Uh, according to information I've read, and I guess this is up to debate, which is why we would need an expert. Uh, if you've been pregnant in the past, your body will show levels of fetal DNA within your own body. Could this little to no fetal DNA exonerate past people she's accused of being pregnant with, like Greg Gillespie, Mike Maricini, and possibly Victim Zero? It's, a, it's an honest question to ask, and I don't have the answer to it, but it's an honest question. You know, you got. I know I've been accused of being biased or I think it's an honest question that we have blood samples that I believe came straight out of not just her blood, but out of out of like the uh, um, uh, you know the baby making organs, right? Don't they they extract the blood? I don't know that. I don't know the details. Ravgen goes to her house. They get the blood. So there's no mistake about whose blood is it? Is it a sister's? No, it's her blood. It's the test is done, and then they come back saying little to no fetal DNA. How little? How nil? We need to know these things. And my guess is we're going to get that information. I can't imagine Ravgen did this whole testing and ended it by just saying, no, nope, little to no DNA. No, what levels? There's got to be percentages and details there that can be further scrutinized. I'm sure the blood samples have been destroyed, but... The results should be there, crystal clear. It's a professional, one you know, innovative company here. Get them here. Get us Brett. Brett, come in. Uh, is Brett from Ravgen an expert witness? I have no idea. Um, we will be there June 10th to cover the story live. Mr. Ecker is extremely late and thus far incomplete. Exp okay, raise the possibility. Okay, so she has to get her own experts. Given that this matter is set for a two-hour evidentiary hearing, Mr. Ecker's extremely late disclosure of nine anticipated trial witnesses raises the possibility that she may need to ask the court to designate this matter as a complex case. For these reasons and many others, it is possible... It is possible substantial additional motion practice may be needed in this case. Understand counsel is fully aware proceedings in this family law department are 
are generally less formal than typical civil cases, and the rules are often more relaxed. Nevertheless, because Mr. Eckert is seeking to expand and aggressively litigate this case in the hopes of obtaining a substantial award of legal of attorney's fees, Miss Jane Doe has no choice but to respond with an appropriate degree of care. That means that Miss Jane Doe must bring certain matters to the court's attention, despite having no desire to do so, if only to protect the appellate record. For all those reasons, Mr. Woodnick's refusal to speak with understand counsel has created an impossible situation. This is an extremely complicated case, and it appears to be growing in complexity with each new and belated disclosure by respondent. They're putting all the onus on Clayton here, right, as the respondent. All of his new disclosures, I mean, you're... Her client's the one who's new to the case. And to say, oh, Mr. Records aggressively litigating this to uh, receive attorney's fees, he's doing what everybody wishes they could do, which is use all of their legal bandwidth to fight for their innocence. He's fighting for his innocence through attorney's fees because that's the only matter left because she pulled the plug on the game, which is she's no longer pregnant or was ever. If they're, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> oh, they're getting me. If there is any hope of resolving this case or even getting the case ready to be resolved in June, the lawyers have a lot to talk about. It seems as though Woodnick doesn't see any hope in resolving this case. He's like, all right, we'll just see you in court. Bring your bring your evidence or don't. For that reason, just as Judge Gaines held in physician's choice, good cause exists for the court under its inherent authority to order respondent's counsel to meet petitioner's counsel for lunch as soon as is reason reasonably practical, hopefully even later this week. Yeah, my guess was he had a gift certificate he needed to use by uh, April 15th. Maybe maybe he's got one of those tax season gift certificates. He's like, Free breadsticks until, the, until a tax day, and then all of a sudden, you know. Now, of course, this would be a tax write-off, uh, folks. As a matter of fairness, it would clearly be inappropriate to allow Respondent's Counsel to ignore Rule 9C by filing motions without first meeting and conferring in person. While Respondent's Counsel simultaneous refuses to speak with Petitioner's Counsel, the rule should either be followed by both parties or the rule should be waived for both. Of course, the undersigned acknowledges the present motion was filed without an in-person or telephone consultation. For each of these reasons, uh, Ms. Jane Doe asked the court to issue an order compelling Respondent's Counsel to accept an invitation for lunch. Oh boy, dating's hard these days, isn't it, folks? It's uh, hard to get a date out there. You got to order, co co you know, compelling information. So here we have his, I guess, previous um, motions that existed. Rules on pending motions to compel acceptance of lunch invitation, just showing that it's been done in the past. Um, I don't have information that the judge has responded to this yet. I'm waiting on getting that information. Um, some have said um, they are documents on their way. Um, uh, so, I don't, again, sorry, there is something in, the, I'm getting something right now that the judge has signed orders, but that's probably Woodnick's motion about the compel from last week. Um, so, we don't know what the document is, but I'm assuming that's just paperwork from the judge from the last motion. So, it seems as though the judge might be a little backlogged here. Each side may be presenting two more lawyers of its own choosing. The principal counsel and the pending motion must personally appear. So, uh, counsel on counsel lunch. Everyone knows that Ruth's Chris, while open for dinner, is not open for lunch. This is a matter of which the court may take judicial notice. What? What are they talking about, Ruth, Chris? Um... So <laughs> do you have to get steak? Is that, is that one of the, all right. Defendants counsel distrust plaintiff's counsel motives and fear. All right. So this is from 2006. The court has no doubt of defendants counsel's ability to withstand plaintiff's counsel's blandishments and they respond Sally for Sally and Barb for Barb. Defendants counsel now makes what may be an illusory acceptance of plaintiff's counsel's invitation by saying, we would love to have lunch at Ruth's Chris with on, uh, you know, the date plaintiff's counsel. So this is the different case, but this is the small ball legal dick measuring we talk about. Everyone knows that Ruth's Chris, while open for dinner, is not open for lunch. I didn't know that. Ruth's Chris. Who's going to Ruth's Chris Steak? No offense. I'm not a big franchise guy here. This I like a I like a mom and pop shop. It's a matter of which the court may take judicial notice. So I guess this in this other case, they were upset that they were like, yeah, we'll meet you for lunch at Ruth's Chris. We'll see you there. They open at 6 p.m. Oh, sorry. Those, those aren't work hours. The time will be noon during a normal business day. The lunch must be conducted and concluded not later than August 18th, 2006. Again, this is a different case. There are a number of fine restaurants within easy driving distance of both council's offices. Christopher's, Vincent's, Morton's, Donovan's, Bistro, Bistro 24 at the Ritz-Carlton, the Arizona Biltmore Grill, Sam's Cafe. Oh, how the how braggadocious they are. Oh, you know, us laymen going to go to Morton's. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll check in at Ritz. Okay, come on. 
Why don't you go? You want to fight for your own family court, guys. Go fight for your clients at McDonald's. Go, go, go iron this out while, uh, you know, somebody throws ball pit balls at you that are covered in, you know, E. coli. Um, anyhow, wild stuff. Um, the cost of the lunch will be paid as follows. Again, this is from the 2006 case. The cost of the lunch will be paid as follows. Total cost will be calculated by the amount of the bill, including appetizers, salads, entrees, and one non-alcoholic beverage per participant. A 20% tip will be added to the bill. Each side will pay its pro rata share according to number of participants. All right. Well, what if, what if you get an extra appetizer and I don't get one? Am I stiff with your bill? Oh, you guys know how that is when you're out traveling and you got that one friend who's, you know, got a, uh, you know, inheritance coming in from their grandmother. So they just order too many appetizers. And it's like, bro, you didn't even finish your blooming onions. I'm not paying for that. That's on you. That's on you. Anyway, to demonstrate to counsel that the court has more on its mind than lunch, the court has considered defendant's motion to strike plaintiff. Okay, so again, these the, the, this is just silly. This is from 2006. But yeah, it's like, I, I get it. What's a judge supposed to do if they're babysitting over people that don't even want to meet to figure this out? But isn't that what the courtroom's for? If you can't figure it out, you can figure it out in court. Will we get a response from Clayton's attorney regarding this? I have no idea. Um, comments from you guys that one said the judge is going to loathe this man before he even steps foot in the courtroom. Look, I mean, I respect the motion to compel lunch. If this is actually a motion that exists, people say, oh, I've worked 50 years. And I've never heard it before. Okay. Well, it looks like it actually happened in 2006. So it is available. Now, the irony here is that Clayton has accused Jane Doe of, of creating, which we've seen the, you know, the, the, um, evidence of this, of creating dating contracts where she says, if you date me with intention, I'll, I'll abort the baby, that type of deal. Right. So, uh, clearly, uh, these date contracts are nothing new. Um, uh, someone said, see, Jane, this is how it's done. You don't just jump right into dating contracts. You get court orders to have lunch first and go from there. Motion to communicate, motion to have lunch, dating with intent contracts. What's next? Motion to compel Clayton to have relations with Jane. Listen, motion for penetration. If we just have one motion for penetration, um, uh, da -da -da -da. so again, we'll have to see uh, how wild this story can get. What will the judge say about the motion for lunch? Um, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a motion to go to the bathroom too. I've been sipping too much coffee today. I got to pee. All right, we'll be back. I'll be all live on Patreon at noon today, noon central standard time. You can go catch me then and we'll be further discussing my guesses. New documents may come in during the Patreon. We'll discuss them then. We'll be back with more right after this.